Well, this morning, um, I want to turn to the Lord in prayer, but also with uh, the knowledge that we have lost some of our dear beloved saints this week, uh, and we want to remember their families. Uh, Bob Marshall passed away earlier this week. Uh, Bob was, um, hadn't been able to come very often, but he was a remarkable man. He uh, was uh, the last World War II fighter pilot I think I have ever known. And uh, so I miss him a great deal. But the loss today that we heard uh, uh, that um, Bud passed away, um, and uh, Bud Rogers, and we uh, are stunned by this. And Gail, we're so glad that you're here with us today because we want to pray with you and your family who are here beside you um, to just um, bless you and let you know that he was always such a, an important part of our church and uh, a vital spirit. And so we grieve with you today. And so this morning, let's uh, turn to the Lord in prayer and ask God's blessing upon us, even as we experience these losses. Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks and praise for the home that you have given us here on earth, for this house of worship, for the time that we have allowed our soul to grow and your spirit has nurtured it with your holy word. We thank you for the grace for being called to be your people. And we thank you, O God, that in this transition time, even as we experience loss, even as we are saying goodbye, we are also welcoming you in a new way into our life. Oh Lord, we pray for those who established this congregation, who were here at the very beginning and their families. We thank you for their faith and their wisdom and their gifts and talents and what has come from it. But we also, Lord, pray for those who will follow in their footsteps. And we pray especially for Pastor Michael and his family as they arrive in Vero Beach. We ask, O oh God, that you will give them opportunity after opportunity to sense the Spirit's movement, to identify it, and to mobilize the people of God for the sake of the gospel. Lord, we pray for this city that we have been entrusted to. Uh, this city belongs to us insofar as we are the caretakers of the gospel. Lord, let the gospel be not just a, a bit of doctrine, a, a, a holy word, but in fact, truly good news that changes lives. So we thank you for all who have preached and taught here, but especially we thank you for the one who is coming to preach, who, who knows you and loves you. And we pray, O oh God, that being united with this great family of faith here at Christ by the Sea, they may find a joy and a purpose that far exceeds what they might have expected. We ask this all through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. So the, the passage today is, um, is pretty simple. It's... Uh, it's one of those great summaries of the gospel message 
that lie in the scriptures, uh, in the teachings of Jesus and the letters of all the apostles, but this one is from Paul, and it is one of my favorite uh, su summaries of, of the gospel, um, but it goes deeper than just an outline sketch of the important points of the gospel. It actually looks in at the dynamics and the growth of the gospel, how it actually comes upon us and takes us over and inhabit our being. So this is from the fifth chapter of Romans, and it reads like this. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given us, in Jesus' name, the Word of God for the people of God. You know, had I been here uh, during the week, um, and I even thought about getting here early to do this, but I would have had to really get here early to do this. I was going to, um, this would be part of the children's story too, I was gonna set up dominoes all across the altar rail, down there, and then up across the next altar rail, and then just, give them a shove. I love watching that. I love watching the dominoes fall. In fact, you know, it, the, here's the funny thing. I had to come to Vero Beach to learn how to play the actual game of dominoes. Up until this point in my life, I always thought that dominoes were simply for making these fantastic trails of, of of action, of one knocking down the next. I thought that's all it was for. I didn't know why there were dots on them, it, but it made for an interesting look. I love these kinds of, what well, you remember, they're also been described as Rube Goldberg devices, you know, where one thing kicks another thing off and another thing leads to another thing and another thing leads to another thing. Well, amazingly enough, that is exactly how the Apostle Paul describes the Christian life. It is one thing initiating another thing, and after that, there's yet still another thing, and beyond that, there's something else, and it's all connected together. And when we live our lives in the hope of Jesus Christ, things start happening. The dominoes start to roll over. And even the way Paul writes this is extraordinary. And it, it, it is linguistically just that, dominoes rolling over. We also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, hope does not disappoint us. So we can see how one thing leads to another. So often in our world today, we think of this sort of inevitability in a much darker light. You know, we remember, uh, we remember in, uh, in that famous song, There's Trouble in River City, that just one little thing, a pool hall, a pool hall in a peaceful little town will lead suddenly to drinking whiskey and staying out and all kinds of horrible things. There's trouble in River City, my friends. 
There is a slippery slope that we're going down. You've heard this in our political rhetoric. It's been there since our country was founded. And the idea is that when we go from one generation to the next, things get slightly worse. It's inevitable. Things are worse now than they were 50 years ago, right? I mean, a lot of us, well, of course, right? I mean, sure, they have iPhones now and they have, you know, all kind of computers and so much technology, but do people simply enjoy nature? Do they simply obey their parents? Do the, I mean, honestly, it seems to many of us that things are just gradually getting worse and more worse, and yes, I'm gonna say this word, worser. <laughs> I think I've mentioned this before, but my father was a great proponent of this philosophy. He was, he was, you know, and by the way, it all began years prior to that with a book, a set of books called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Mr. Gibbon wrote this massive scholarly work that showed how one thing led to another and how the Roman Empire eventually fell in upon itself because of the corruption that was within it. People have used that book, or at least the example of that book, to say We're, it's the same thing is happening all over again. Well, you know, you can stare at that as long as you want. But guess what, you're, guess what you're not doing when you do that? You're not changing anything. When you say something is inevitable, then it means I'm not, I'm not involved. It, I, I have no power. It's, I'm a victim. Or our children are the victim. But my friends, I want to talk to you today about what is inevitable from God's point of view. And it's important that we understand this. Sometimes we think the forces of secular worldly America have become so, so headed for disaster, you know, the recent crises that we're experiencing are a perfect example. We are so convinced of this that we forget that the power of God far outstrips the power of any nation. As Isaiah says, the nations are as a drop in the bucket compared to the power of God. So I want to just explore this here because what is occurring in this passage is inevitable. It must happen. It will happen. And not just in general, not just vaguely so, but in fact, this could be your personal route. This could be the path that your life takes if a few things happen. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a simple theological statement, but boy, is it deep. Boy, is it deep. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you at peace with God? Is your life reflective of someone who is at peace? Not at war with God, not struggling with God, not angry at God, not, you know, maybe that happens from time to time, but who, regardless of what else is happening in your life, things between you and God are just fine. 
Whether or not that is the case, that is what God wishes for you to be at peace with him. And we know that peace that God has for us is not responsible, it's not, it doesn't depend upon our own responsibility, our holiness, how good we are, all these things, you know, it, all these things that we have done to try to improve our life, make it better, you know what? The most important thing is what we receive as a gift. That's why Paul says we are justified by faith. It means simply that we trust that God is saving us. We trust, we truly do trust in our heart that he's got us. It may seem like we're dangling over an abyss sometimes. It may seem like there's no hope sometimes. It may seem like we are truly at risk, but we know that God's got us. And so we can be at peace. Ask yourself that question today. And I don't refer to those moments when, you know, suddenly <laughs> you're driving along and the oil light starts blinking on your car and you know there's something wrong. The check engine light goes off or you're stopped at a stoplight and bam, somebody hits you from behind. And there's a crisis here, a crisis there. You know, the things that life will throw you from time to time, there's something on your skin, you check it out with a doctor, that we've gotta have further tests. Yes, those things disturb us, but in fact, there is an ocean of peace that we are afloat on. And God's got us. Is that how it is with you? Well, if it is the case, then things should start to happen. So often when we think of holy or religious people, that it seems like they're just, and even if I think of the actual holy people that I've known in my life, they seem so holy, they almost seem like statues. Nothing ever changes in their life. They're just uh, seemingly perfect. They don't seem very vital, like anything's going on in their life. But what Paul seems to be telling us here is that when we have peace with God, it unlocks a sequence that is inevitable, that is sacred, and that is powerful, and it is, in the end, what we hope for more than anything else. And so, he says, we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we boast in our sufferings. We brag about all the times we fall on our face or the times we are put down or when trouble attends to us, it's okay because God's glory is gonna show up in a remarkable way. Has anybody suffered here this week? Has anybody had a hard time, had a doubt, had a heartache? had trouble. My friends, when we have the hope of glory and peace of God in our hearts, it's simply an opportunity for the good Lord to start showing off how good he is. Paul puts it this way. He says that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. Now, some of these things I've heard interpreted to me before. I think I heard this from a football coach a long time ago. 
Suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces, well, he would say victory, but nonetheless, it's a similar kind of speech. And so he would make it his personal mission to make sure that when we went to practice, we suffered, right? I mean, the man was brutal. I mean, if, you know, you'd work hard for an hour and a half doing all your drills, this, that, and the other, and then he'd say, he'd give us a rousing little speech at the end of practice, and then he'd say, now, give me three miles around the track. Like, what? He said, it's good for you. It's good for you because it will produce endurance. You will be stronger than the other team because running hard to the point that you're to, almost gonna drop will make you better on the field. And, it, and then he said, it will also build your character. Has anybody been told that? If, if, if you suffer, if you encounter resistance, if you have difficulty in front of you, it just builds your character. And I gotta tell you, oftentimes, after I've heard that, even as a young person, I would say, you know, I think I have enough character. <laughs> could, could I like, you know, go light on character perhaps and, and just sort of sidestep some of these things. I, am, I, I appreciate that God is working on my personal development, but could I just have a day off? So when I was, uh, when I was in seminary, I, I did the stupidest things because, you know, I thought I'm so poor, I just, I've got to handle these things. Instead of, say, asking my father for money so I could pay for my little sticker on my tag, right? Back then, Georgia had a, a tax that was attached to that, and it was actually quite expensive. This is about 30, 40 years ago. And I just, one year, I just did not have the money to pay for that thing. Fortunately, the new tag was, um, instead of yellow with light, white letters, it was a black tag with white letters. Well, a Sharpie could fix that. <laughs> this is confession time, right? So I just sat down at my bumper and very carefully went over all the yellow with a black Sharpie, and voila, I had a new tag. That produced nothing but anxiety and worry for the next eight months. Because whenever I saw a police car, and in Atlanta, you always see a police car. I had to make sure that he didn't get behind me so he could run my tags for whatever reason. Because I had, I, look what I had done. I would taken that shortcut. And what I couldn't do was humble myself to ask for a favor just to say to my parents or to somebody, I need some help with my tag. Instead, I tried to control the whole situation. This sequence that Paul is outlining for us is an invitation to let God's inevitability, his way to take over my life and your life. There will be days and there will be times when we chicken out and say, no, 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 I'm going to, I got to handle this. But when we take those shortcuts and, and when we try to handle it all by ourselves on our own, inevitably it leads to what? No peace. We lose that peace or it seems obscured. 
we can't identify it anymore. We know that if we let God's inevitable progress occur in our lives, and by the way, John and Wesley call this sanctification. When we say yes to that, trusting in God's love for us in Christ Jesus, then the peace of God, it'll be all around us. We'll be floating upon it. In fact, Paul uses several metaphors here for peace with God, but I think the most profound one is that it is, in fact, like water, poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Now, my friends, in the next week, the next few months, that is going to start in a brand new way around here. Trust me on this. This is the experience of the Methodist church and the Methodist way of doing things. In fact, if this were 100 years ago, the fact that Haley and I had been here for three years would be something to be marveled at because we've been here for so long. One of the churches that we were assigned to, Fernandina Church in, on the very northeast tip of Florida, the oldest United Methodist Church in Florida, had a record of the pastors in the narthex, had their name and the years they served. And for the first, I'd say 30 or 40 years, I don't think there was a single pastor who served more than two years, almost all of them one year and then they changed. One year, then they changed. One year, then they changed. Can you imagine a new pastor every year? Well, as a matter of fact, it was a wonderful thing for the church because the church grew like a weed. It just blossomed because the church was getting the best gifts of so many different pastoral authorities and they brought their best stuff to the church. So starting next week, you're gonna get the very best gifts that Pastor Michael has. All the things that God has endowed him with, he's gonna offer to you, and he's gonna savor and, and give thanks to God for the congregation that he has received, and the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon you. It's important to understand that this is the way that God works. There is an, ine an inevitability to it. And the best thing for us as Christians is to simply give in to God's program for us. Because it does lead, as I said before, to peace with God to a confidence that the world can't give us, to a deepness that this shallow culture we live in cannot even understand. So my friends, I am excited about what is gonna happen for Christ by the sea. Not simply because Pastor Michael is an amazing pastor. I know his record, I've seen his work, and, and that I have every confidence, but I also know you, and I, I am so thankful for you. Uh, the way you have said goodbye to us and how you have blessed us and in these last few months has been extraordinary. And so it's like I'm seeing very clearly two wonderful spirits, the spirit of this congregation, the spirit of this pastor, and when they come together, God is going to do great things. So I invite you to, um, if you haven't already, to sort of change the way you face the next few months. Sometimes, um, sometimes, well, here's where it gets probably the worst for not just Methodists, but American Protestants in general. When they find out they're getting a new pastor, most Protestant churches 
the laity begins to wonder, they ask the wrong questions that are not here in this line of dominoes. Instead, they ask things like, will he like me? Will I like him? Is he a decent preacher? Is he going to get people involved in church? Instead, we should be asking, is he going to get me involved in church? Is, is my spirit going to be so enriched that I will be a source to those around me? That's really the questions to begin asking. Not will I like him, not will I enjoy it, not is this going to fit my life, but rather, what is God doing here? What is God doing here? So, my prayer is with you, my thoughts are with you. Haley and I are so grateful for the three years that we have spent here, but what we know is on the way is even greater still. And we are glad for that. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for what is about to happen, for the way that you nourish us, for the way that you let this process open up in our lives. Lord, we pray that you will grant us your peace, that as we enter into the the justification that we experience in Christ Jesus, it'll just start clicking off some amazing, miraculous things. Let that be for us. We ask this, dear Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.